Today, I sit down with Jessica Sigmund out of Connecticut, who in a few short years has built out a nine-person team. What I loved about today's chat is she shares her secret as to how 60% of her business comes way of referral. As always, I'm your host in San Francisco Connection, Sean Kunkler. Jessica, welcome back. Thanks for doing this a second time, though we didn't air the first one because of a huge debacle on the back end. So I appreciate you. The debacles happen. <laughs> I'm excited to be here again. Uh, so this has actually been really cool. We've been, I've been getting more agents across Compass and then just generally across the nation pinging me and saying like, hey, who do you know in this market? Which I think is cool. The referral network is starting to build. So before we get started, can you give everybody an idea of where you and your team focus so listeners, agents can have an idea? Yes, yes. So I am Jess Sigmund with the Sigmund team. We are in Westchester, Fairfield, and Rockland County, which is New York and Connecticut. So about a half an hour or so out of the city and then on the other side of the Tappan Zee Bridge, which is the Hudson River. So we service three different counties, two different states. That's incredible. Do you have a price point or an ideal client that you work with? So generally, I would say our price point here in Greenwich area or in Greenwich, Connecticut is like two and a half to three million is like a starter home mm -hmm. here. But I have 18 members and we are spread out. So our price points go from $200,000 co-ops to six, seven, eight million dollar houses. Oh, that's amazing. It's, it's, it's funny. I'm from Connecticut, as you know. But similarly, we I work in the San Francisco market, but then when people tend to have kids, they generally move to Marin or the East Bay. And then if they get a job at Apple or Tesla or Meta, they tend to move south to the South Bay. And so similar to you, I've been strategically trying to figure out, okay, how do I partner with agents in these different markets so we can keep it within our ecosystem and basically provide the same level of service wherever they're making those moves. Um, but ours is not, it's all within the same state. So yours, it feels like, sounds like, it just creates this whole new layer of challenge because I'm sure there's different contracts and compliances and statutory documents and process. Yeah, actually, funny enough, you say that the New York just decided just went to disclosure state where Connecticut had already been a disclosure state. So for us, it was such an easy transition because we had already worked in Connecticut with disclosures, property disclosures. So for New York to change, it was very seamless for us because we were so used to it. So there is overlap. You do have to know the laws of two different states. I like literally live two minutes from New York. So I really am on like one side of the street is New York, one side's Connecticut. We're really on the border. So it would have been hard for me to have not done both because people start their tours in, you know, one area and by 10 minutes later, they're in the next state. They really look in both states equally. Um, I think prior to COVID, it was much different. People were really dialed into certain towns and certain areas because of the lack of inventory. People are much more spread out now, right? They're looking in bunch of different places, especially for us. We have a lot of suburbs around us. That's interesting. And, and I found the same, same thing that happens here is when inventory is tight, people tend to, they'll either expand the type of property that they're looking at. So with us, they'll get priced out of single family homes or there's just not enough inventory. So then they start looking at condos also, yep. or then they start looking at, they'll push out the the geography and just kind of ultimately to your point cast a bigger net so they can find those things um that's interesting i mean from just a like a team lead perspective i feel like that throws such a curveball of n having to know a lot of small things in two vastly different markets though there there's similarities yeah i mean taxes to me, when I think about what's the biggest struggle, it's kind of something more like the taxes because every municipality has such a different understanding and such a different tax rate. So 
we really have to be doing constant research when we're bidding on certain houses. Like some some areas assess off of 100% sales price and some areas don't, you know? So kind of understanding that is probably the most difficult, but otherwise I feel like real estate is real estate. Like as long as you do your research and you pull your comps, we're not allowed to legally talk about school districts. We're not allowed to jump into like, you know, that kind of stuff. So people really have to kind of, to be a little bit educated when they come to us as far as what they're looking for and then we help kind of dial them in. Um, I really love to be spread out over the three counties. We just moved to the third county now um, because people are going everywhere and I know that I can trust somebody if they're, especially if they're on our team, to go help them in Rockland County or go help them in Fairfield County. So it's been really nice to have this three markets. And we have a team member that is licensed in Jersey even, so we refer her stuff in Jersey. So we really are, we can really help people a lot in our area. <laughs> wow, you are, it sounds like, really spreading out the footprint fast. What's, as a team lead, what's your, what's your strength? What's your superpower? Is it the organization, networking, systems? Yeah. Ah, uh, gosh, superpower. I think generally speaking, it's always been networking, like these types of things that are so awesome. Um, the reason my business grew so quickly was because of the referral network. And I will never not like be so very thankful for the fact that I have this network. I think 60% of my business comes from agent to agent referrals. Wow. I never was good at cold calling, door knocking, you know, any of those things. Everything for me has, I'm such a like deeply connected person in the sense that I want to know somebody and I want to feel connected to them that cold leads are really hard. Um, but yeah. knowing that your cousin, your cousin's calling me, that's moving to Connecticut. That's, I, I want to take care of them. You know, it's a, it's a totally different feeling. Yeah. I mean, that's an incredible 60% is a huge, that's a huge number um, yeah. to, to have built your business. And remind me, you've only been in the business since 2018. Yeah. I've correct? been basically like seven years in the business, six, seven years. Yeah. Which it's a long time and also a very short time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, to, <laughs> to have established yourself the way that you have and then built your team the way that you have in that period of time, that's, that's very impressive. Do you find, um, let me rephrase the question, where within the 60% and these agent to agent networks, is this on a national level? Is it kind of like next door? Is it people who, agents who are licensed in New York, but don't go into Connecticut or vice versa? Like who's, who's kind of the, what's the bread and butter, if you will? Yeah, actually you're hitting it right on the head. And that's why you're so good at these podcasts because you are so dialed into the conversation, but it it's actually both. It's 50% me being in the Connecticut office and people don't go over to New York and they'll refer us over to Westchester or vice versa, we're in New York and they don't go over to Connecticut. So we'll get a lot of just networking just from our office in general, which is really nice. Um, same with our Rockland County. People don't go to Rockland here, even though it's 20 minutes away. So we get thought of, um, fortunately. And then it's also like the retreats. It's also the networks of you in San Francisco and my colleagues nationally. Um, I would say that's 50% of it, going out to these retreats, going, I'm in a mastermind group, I'm in um, any type of event that I could do, ninja, et cetera. I, I use all of those networks. That's incredible. Ninja is amazing, by the way. And, and there's zero affiliation like we're, we're, neither one of us are sponsored or going to pay for it, but I've done, I've been in sales. I've only been in real estate for nine ish years and I've been doing sales for 20. And I would say of all the trainings I've ever done, Ninja was by far the best because it's not about selling. It's about this whole structure of the relationship. And then the byproduct is the sale. Yeah, uh, Ninja was like a little bit of a slower time and I was like, let me do something. You know, when it gets slow, I'm always trying to find something. So I jumped on a Ninja class in New York City. From the Ninja class, I made a ton of referrals or networks or friends or colleagues just from being in that group. Um, and then from there is also just learning that it's not the sales, it's the, you know, human aspect of it. It's funny, you hit the nail on the head, and I think people miss that one also. This is like a very small nuanced thing, is if you're taking a class, a seminar, a training, whatever it is, don't do it in your backyard. Go away. Go to a feeder market and go there 
because the agents that you're going to be sitting next to and making friends with and making new connections with are potentially going to be your referral network in the future rather than sitting with everybody from your office. It's you already know them. Yeah, New York City is huge for us. I mean, majority, I think of our San Francisco, I think is one of the biggest referrals, believe it or not, nationally from San Francisco to Connecticut, which is crazy. But also New York City is our number one, you know, people yeah. moving out of the city, starting families are coming over to Westchester, New York, or, you know, Connecticut, Greenwich, etc. You know, it's a really fun like don't waste time doing this, but it's a fun little side project is go to, to U-Haul and see where the inventory is going. And you can kind of get a sense of the feeder markets of like, where are the U-Hauls actually going when they leave here? And then, and I know from Connecticut, it's kind of like when I was wanting to venture out and be in a city, I, I of course looked at Boston, looked at New York, looked at LA, looked at all the major cities. Uh, so it only makes sense. Um, what brought you to San Francisco? That's a great question. Um, oh God. Um, a lifetime ago, I worked for my father's manufacturing company and hated it. I just, it wasn't in my DNA. And, uh, I really was, uh, excited about health and fitness. And so I wound up getting my personal training license, was really getting into martial arts, very heavy. This is the early, early days of UFC. And I was just completely enamored by that world. And uh, I probably watched way too many Bruce Lee movies. And I wanted to go somewhere. Well, I wanted to, to go experience a city as one part. And then the second part is I wanted to be in a hub where I can study martial arts. Where was it like abundant? And I knew San Francisco had a lot of traditional martial arts. And, and of course, Again, we looked at a lot of different places and then ultimately picked San Francisco. Um, funny enough, my I came here uh, sight unseen. Just we drove cross country and appeared here. Uh, but I did have when I was in, like 12 years old, I had a pen pal who lived in San Francisco. And so that was my only like knowledge of it. And this is like early internet. It wasn't like you can just search like best places in San Francisco. There was no YouTube. There was none, like none of that stuff existed. So, and I've been here ever since. That is such a crazy story, but that shows you, well, first of all, obviously follow your heart and that works as well, coincides with real estate. Um, and you had your dream, you know, and so you made it there and then obviously you're happy there. So that's valuable. I mean, you get a lot better weather than we get sometimes here for sure. That is true. That was the one thing I didn't realize until I got here was how even the weather is year round. Um, but I would say what's, what's interesting is I don't practice martial arts anymore. I've had just way, way too many injuries to, for that to be a sustainable career. Uh, but the health and fitness, and I know you work out religiously because I see it on your Instagram. With this business, it is so incredibly stressful working out is the one thing that just keeps me sane it i just if i don't do it it's i just feel different like i have to go and just like burn off that energy so i can give myself fully to the business or to my clients yeah it's so funny you say that because i think about it all the time and my fiance jokes around about it every pretty much every single day because it's like can't miss f45 you know like gotta go every single day and i'm like no i actually really can't miss f45 like yeah. i actually physically like emotionally cannot like i need this in my day and that 45 minutes of calmness which is crazy because it's the opposite of calmness it's yeah. intense and you know but it's calmness for me and it helps me be able to feel good about myself and my day and fitness yeah. is hugely important to me same. I actually work out twice a day. I do a treadmill session first thing in the morning, and then I do an evening, like actual lifting session. And if I miss, like if I have just crazy stuff going on and I, and I have to do a light day or I just straight up have to miss, I notice it. And there's tons of studies. Your, it regulates your uh, hormone levels, your your dopamine, it gets regulated, like all of these amazing things happen from, from working out. 
Um, it balances your testosterone, reduces cortisol, like all these amazing things that we know it does, it, it, it does. And so yeah. I'm a huge advocate, even my team, it's, it's amazing and I love it. My team members are like, hey, I'm now working out like every day. And I'm like, that's amazing. And I just, I know the benefits it's brought to me in my life through the years. And it's, it's that one constant I will never give up. Yeah. Yeah. I have two of my team members have just joined me coming at 45, which has been really fun, you know, and, and it's networking in the gym is also huge. Like when COVID happened, I started to work out at one of my really good friends, garage um, gyms, like two doors down. And I started to realize how much I was missing that avenue of connections. Because when I went to CrossFit or I went to other gyms, I made friends and I made people that would think about me. And, but like F45 is a newer workout for me. I've only been doing it for a few months, but when I'm there, I'm not so much networking because it's pretty much you go in, you have your workout and you leave. So I haven't built that friend base yet there. I've just been so like in love with the workout that I haven't really gotten branched out to start to know people, but it's so such a cool way to meet people that have the same interests as you, obviously just the sense that they like the gym and like working out and um, the energy of the room together. So my goal is to eventually make some friends at F45 do. Which I think is brilliant, right? Because inevitably people are like, oh, so what do you do? Like it just is casual conversation and it's like, it's not a forced thing. It's, it's a very natural process. Um, you reminded me the Knox brothers out of Florida, yeah. they decided they really wanted to embed themselves in a specific neighborhood that happens to be next to a golf course. And so literally in their business plan, they have golf, go golf, because when you're on the golf course and you're hanging out like you're filling in a spot and you're with a few other people, inevitably, just as we said, people, what do you do? And if the conversation of real estate comes up, then you now have a new opportunity to talk about you or your business. Oh, yeah, I love the Knox brothers. Actually, my grandma's visiting and they are from, my grandma lives in Bonita and they live in Bonita. So they always say like, we gotta take your grandma out to Breffitt's. And I'm like, yes, of course. but. That golf is huge. There's a girl, Jaliska, on my team, and she loves golf, and she's made a huge network. I mean, anything that you, what I tell my team is, like, we're not the type that, like, sit in there, and I'm like, jump on the phones, or, you know, that that's not our vibe. I'm like, go find what you like, and then branch off from that, you know, like, find your authenticness, or whatever it is, you know, whether it's working out or food or golf or if you're in AA like find your people there like just that's how I try to teach my team like we don't have that similar business plan of a lot of people that a lot of people do where like hit the phones and I'm like hit the dog park you know hit the things yeah. that you like you know how to tell when you hit onto it like when you're talking to somebody and you hit onto that other thing in their life that they love I noticed it with you immediately and if somebody's listening they can go back and replay it the speech pattern speeds up. They people actually get excited. You're like, Oh my God, a friend. I love talking about this. They love talking about let's talk about this more. It's, you know, I've used this analogy before, but it's like if you're traveling to, let's say Italy, and you walk into a bar, and everybody's speaking Italian, and you don't and you're kind of meandering through and you hear somebody in the distance speaking English, you're like, Oh, my goodness, where are you from? <laughs> yep. There's an instant connection just because of that one thing. And so, yeah, I a hundred percent agree. I, whatever that thing that you find a lot of joy in outside of this business, go figure out how to do it and be around new people. If it's pottery, go take pottery classes and hang out and be super enthusiastic. Cause again, earlier people will always inevitably ask, oh, what do you do? And you don't even have to bring it up. You can ask them, what do you do? And a hundred percent of the time they'll reciprocate. They'll answer the question and then volley it back. Yeah. And it's also the people that generally, like, I feel like I'm a very introverted person, right? So I don't really love small talk. So I want to talk about things that I love, you know? And yeah. so if I try to stay in situations where I'm able to talk about things I love, it feels more genuine to me, you know, versus having the like, how you doing? How's the weather? You know, those conversations, which don't do anything for me, you know? Um, so I, I think, it, yeah, I can't, they, they stress me out. You know, I would prefer to avoid <laughs> that at all costs. It's funny. I'm the same way. I'm, I'm, I'm like borderline introvert, extrovert and small talk. I, I hate it. Like I will do anything to avoid it. 
or if you're in a uh, like a small group and everybody's having small talk, I will just like find the exit. Yeah. <laughs> just be like, I'm, I'm not doing this. I can't do this. Yeah, I think that even just our initial talk when we were first getting on the call earlier, we were talking about what to talk about. And I was thinking like, what's real? Like, what can we talk about that's like relevant and real? Because like, we don't need to talk about obviously things that are just generic because what would be we be here for and why would anyone want to listen you know but if we can talk about things that are relevant and relatable and you know the most on social media as well the most comments and the most um you know interaction i get is when i'm being genuine and when i'm like yeah. posting the things that might somebody else might not want to post but it's true you know like yeah. Um, whether it's having a bad day versus having a good day or having anxiety or whatever it is, people are just like very right away will relate to it or talk about losing out on deals versus always winning deals, you know? I, you know, I, I completely agree. And I, I think there's a huge mistake that a lot of agents do is they post on Instagram, for example, which Instagram, by the way, is the number one platform for agents, period. And well, two mistakes that they make that I found from my experience and then from talking to a ton of the top agents with the biggest followers ever is one, they only talk about this is the property I sold. This is the property I listed. This is what I sold. This is what I listed, blah, blah, blah. And it's no one cares. But you, for example, is, oh, I'm going to do this and it relates to real estate. And then here's my workout. Totally unrelated to real estate. It's and here's the personal parts of my life, good and bad. That's, those are the pieces when you do those right on social media, those are the things that people remember and they connect with you. And then they start finding, like they, they start finding your values and they find the connection and not for nothing, but we talked heavily about 60% of your business is referrals. When I'm sending a referral, Sure, track record, performance, all of that is incredibly important. But the bottom line is my client has a goal and I need to find an agent who's going to facilitate that. And here's the here's the end. My client has to enjoy the process. And if my client loves working out, they love being social, they love this, they love that, and I know that agent it has those same things. Like you just mentioned the the Knox brothers and you know things about them. And so if your client or your mom is in the area and needs service, you're immediately, hypothetically, if you're, if you're, you're like, oh my God, my mom is an avid golfer. She loves talking about golf, loves it inside and out. And you're like, oh my God, the Knox brothers do too. And they do real estate. It's immediately an amazing connection. Yeah, and I think it helps. What I have learned and what I used to struggle with a lot is that I am not gonna be for everybody, right? So like, exactly. I, and when I'm not for everybody, you know, at first, you know, you automatically have your ego, so you're gonna feel bad about it and, and that's natural. But when you get, separate the ego yeah. and you get away from that, you realize I don't have to be for everybody. Like that's okay. And so I want to find the people that I genuinely, what I loved so much about getting into this business, um, I got divorced, moved here, really wanted to figure out my independence. I never wanted to be forced to be unhappy again. So when I started to work and I started to get busy enough where I could choose to work with people that I wanted to work with, it was like the most freeing feeling in the world because I didn't have to work with like a jerk. You know, I didn't have to work yeah. with somebody that wasn't going to be nice to me. Um, and I hope forever that I continue to do enough good that will help continue my business that I don't ever have to work with those people again. I can work with people that are like me, that are good people, that are nice, that are kind. Um, of course, you're going to get one here and there. That's fine. But like for the most part, I don't want to work with jerks anymore. <laughs> you know, the, the, the best feeling in the world, the absolute best feeling in the world is knowing you meet somebody and you know, intuitively, you're like, this is just not a good fit for me. Yep. And then you think, but I have the agent who they would totally gel with. And you make that phone call and you make that introduction and you wash your hands of it and walk away. That is the best feeling in the world because you know they're to be taken care of and you have zero part of it. Yeah. I, and I, and I tell my clients that I like, or my team members that I'm like, you don't, you don't have to be mistreated. And the sooner and the more you learn to 
have boundaries and say no, the better you're going to set yourself up to find your people, right? So like if you if you sacrifice and you're like, I want the deal more than I want the client, whatever, what vice versa, you'll start working with people that are going to drain your energy, that are going to take away from you, and then you're not going to be able to be the person you want to be for the good clients, right? So that's why I try to not do that because I want to be able to show up my 100% happiest best version for my good clients and if I have a, yeah. a jerk I'm working with and they're taking and draining my energy and making me miserable then I can't be who I need to be for my good clients a hundred percent and and at the beginning of the when I started my career it was unfortunately I had to adjust my standards because I needed I needed to I needed the I needed the traction is what I needed and so I worked with those clients who were bad in the beginning, they were bad in the middle, they were bad at the end, and it was just hard the whole time. And to your point, my levels of anxiety were really high, and that bled into other areas of my business. And now I'm, like, if I'm getting the sense in the beginning that it's just not a good fit, they're toxic or reactive, and I, I just, I'm not the agent. And that's fine. And, and, and to your point, it's maturity and time, I think, is to realize that, I'm not for everybody and that's amazing, but I want to be for those few who really want to work with me, period. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it's a female driven industry, right? I believe that there's substantial amount of women than men in the industry, but also it's hard to, it's also can be hard to be a female in the industry and you have to figure out where to fit yourself in. Um, you're working with younger couples or you're working with people that are just married. Um, you want to make sure that everybody is comfortable. Everybody feels the same. You, what I love about my having a team, what I think is so important is like Caitlin and I partner up all the time. She's on my team and she's a Greenwich agent and she'll be wonderful and with the wife. And sometimes I'm more analytical and I fit better working on like the, the number side with the husband and I don't have that thing that she has with the wife. And it's like so great because that shows you exactly what you what we're talking about you have to you have to find your people and partnering up with another agent is not always so bad either because sometimes you can use your superpowers that you both have figure out what you're good at she figures out what she's good at and we come together and use those together so that's been like really having a team has been really fun to do that because you really could figure out who is a good fit who has the most patience on my team this client is going to need a lot of patience perfect i know the right person you know I completely agree. And, and, you know, in, in, in addition to like, I, in my mind, I know and see the systems, but when it comes to actually documenting and putting them down, I'm terrible at it. And I know that about me. And so like, I can, I can map it out, but I need somebody to actually go behind me and like clean it all up and make it make sense. And so early in my career, I didn't understand, I didn't even understand the listing process or I, did I have the organization? So I partnered with an agent in the office that I knew had a killer system. And I partnered basically for that college education. And so I, I, there's a lot of strategic ways to pull people into deals to get to either better service the client, to help, help you evolve as an individual agent, sometimes just to figure something out. Um, it's, yeah, uh, I think that's so important. I mean, we're very similar. I don't have the sit at a computer office understanding of like paperwork and list. That's why my business partner, Brian, who's my, um, he's our team director. He does all the back end and he's amazing at it. And I do not know what I would do without him because like he gives me the opportunity to be able to be client facing and out with my clients and doing stuff like this because he prefers to be sitting at the computer and he prefers to be that person and that's him. So we are such a good fit and it's so important to find what your strengths are and then what your weaknesses are and be okay with both of them. You know, it's, it's really funny and I don't know how I, my, brain just connected these dots but I remember talking to an agent who was thinking about hiring um, they, they wanted to hire an assistant and to your point if you're kind of the mess maker your assistant on the back end is the mess cleaner and they're wired completely different and this agent said oh I'm gonna pay them a percentage of each of my transactions and I was like that's interesting we are agents we love the thrill of the chase we love the anxiety we love we love all these things that most people don't love. We love these commission checks, these big hits. And you're now basically taking that 
and applying it to somebody who loves consistency and expecting them to love these erratic cycles that you actually find joy in. And it's like you have to, when you start building teams, you have to think about what's important to them. And that thing that's important to them is probably not going to be important to you at all. And yep. you have to wear these these different hats and you have to approach it. And so, again, kudos for building a nine-person team. That's aside from running your own business and understanding all the hats your clients are wearing, understanding the people on your team, that's an incredibly challenging yeah. It's just incredibly challenging. Yeah, I would say that it's been a lot more challenging and I'm really learning what I want in team members. Before I was just growing and getting bigger and I realized that the team members that I were potentially bringing on were fairly draining. They weren't what I was looking for in team members or maybe I was draining them, you know, who knows. But yeah, um, I've learned now that I, being a team leader is, I'm sure, as you know, it's it's hard, you know, like I it's like having a bunch of kids almost and wanting the best for them and, um, you know, wanting to take care of them, but also still needed to take care of myself because I'm still a transactional agent and I survive off of doing deals. You know, it's not like money comes in anywhere else. So I'm still very much transacting, but I'm also wanting to make sure my my team is eating and it's a lot of pressure. So. Um, and sometimes I feel like I've lost a few team members over the last couple of years and learned a lot about what I need on my team and who I need to be. And I'm going to continue to learn, of course, but it's definitely not as easy as it as it looks. No, it's a different it's it's a different hat and it's a different it's a different perspective. And it's sometimes it's hard to to jump from to context switch from working in the business and working on the business and flipping back and forth. Did you, in your past life, prior to getting into real estate, did you have like heavy management or? Uh, um, like no, well, I guess I did. I mean, when I was younger, younger, I managed salons. So that was like my first management thing where I had like, you first managed one salon and then I picked up three or four or five. And so I managed a bunch of salons when I was younger, which taught me the management thing. Um, but otherwise, I think it's just something that is in you. Like I wanted to be a social worker or something in that field, but I also wanted business. So I have a business degree with a minor in human services. So they kind of connected together. Um, and I naturally became a team leader. Uh, not, not really naturally. One of my team members came up to me and was like, I want to be on your team. And I think I told this story last time, but I was like, I don't have a team. <laughs> like, what do you mean? You know? And she was like, well, we'll have it, we'll make a team. And like, she's still with me to this day. She's the golfer on the team. And that was over five years ago. Wow. She made the team. And from there we've grown and grown and grown. And um, she's kind of the best thing that ever happened to me. Cause I didn't, I was thinking I should join the team, but I was not thinking I was worthy or ready to be a team lead. Um, and, and here we are. That's amazing. You know, sometimes people see it for you, even though we don't see it for ourselves. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Just... I'm always thankful for her always always thankful for her that sounds like a really great it sounds like a, a solid partnership and clearly yeah. you both are doing something right if it's lasted for that many years since then yeah i mean she's like family i couldn't see our team without her um she's gone through having a baby on the team and mm -hmm. um we sold her place and she bought her first home and so like we've grown together so much you know as as people um, and it's like you said, sometimes you have to have somebody else see your potential and see your value because yeah. sometimes it's harder for us to see it. Yeah. And it's cool. I found too, there's a compounding effect when you strategically and you hire the right people and you bring them into your, your world and they start seeing the vision of where this thing is going. They bring their own, their own set of attributes and strengths and they help propel this thing in a new, sometimes a new, better direction than what you may have initially thought it was to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, real estate is, I love it. I love it. Even when you're in the downtimes, like the harder markets, like now where you're fairly drained and, you know, every day it's like, you got to have thick skin in this industry. It's either you're rich one day and poor the next. It's just, that's just how it goes. Um, you know, you could have a life changing deal or you could have nothing. Uh, you've got to be able to take that and um, not let it tear you down. And sometimes it sometimes it's hard, but for the most part, you have to remember that it comes back up. 
you know, if you keep doing the right thing and you keep yeah. learning and you keep keeping up with the market and being knowledgeable, we're like you said, the strong survive at the end. Yeah, I mean, my the thing that I always try to remind myself is one of my clients, funny enough, was a therapist and he's like, oh, it's interesting. You use this analogy a lot, but I feel like everything is seasonal. And right now we're in winter in the market and it's not going to last. It never does. And then what follows winter is spring. And so if you just get through the hardest winter, spring is on the other side of that. And so I, I always try to remind myself, like, this is gonna, this is just a cycle. And even when it was amazing, it was like this amazing fall. And we were all just doing abundantly well. But what follows fall? Winter. And so it's kind of prepare because the season's not going to last. It's just it's just a season and ride it through. Um, my question to you out of that is... If you were able to rewind to, let's say, 2017, right before you got into the business, what's the one piece of advice that you would give yourself? Well, uh, when I first got into the business, I went off on my own. I had no idea what I was doing. I worked for my family's management company and I was managing their buildings. And I was like, okay, this is great, but making $15 an hour sitting at a desk is torture and I hated it. So. I realized that I loved real estate though. So I got my license and got into it and I went off on my own. And that was the first thing I did wrong because I had no idea what I was doing. I had zero idea. Like as a real estate agent, we are, it is mind boggling to me that we are responsible for most people's biggest purchases they ever make in their entire life. And we take a course and now all of a sudden we can sell you two, three, five million dollar houses, 500,000, whatever. How does that happen? Like, how am I how am I responsible for that, right? So for me to go off on my own, and I remember I had a good friend that was moving here from Florida, and he wanted to buy a house, and it was like a $500,000 house, and I was like, oh, my God, like, I'm so nervous that I'm going to mess this up. Like, this is so much money, and um, I think any new agent should join a team. Any new agent should have somebody above them that knows what they're doing, that can teach them, that can guide them, show them you are so responsible for somebody's, you know, savings, everything they've worked for in their life, um, where they're going to celebrate things, where they're going to have their family, like where they're going to have their good days and their bad days. You need to know what you're doing, right? So I think what I would have done differently is I would have gone on a team right from the beginning. And I think everybody should, to be honest, um, to just know. And if you decide that you're an entrepreneur and you decide you want to go off and start your own team one day, great. But at least you have the tools now. I'm on the same page. Um, one of the managing brokers, when I first got into business, it was in passing in one of the meetings. She said the number one mistake agents make is, one, they don't ask and they just kind of assume the answer. And, and ultimately that leads to a lot of problems. And, and, and assuming you know the answer or just not even knowing that you don't know is a massive risk, um, especially to your point, when you're talking about somebody's huge investment in their life, it's, there's, there's so many things that can, can, go, can go haywire. Um, yeah, I, I actually think my two cents is the bar of entry should be higher um, for for what we do um, and for the risks that we're we're involved with um, because th there's just so many moving parts in this business and uh, but I would say which which I think is really cool is the the top performers do separate and you and I hadn't talked about this before but you knew exactly who the Knox brothers were a handful of states south of you. And they're on the other side of the country from me. And so the top players know who the top players are. And so if somebody is at least lucky enough to work with a really solid agent and they need help in other areas, they'll at least be really highly connected. Uh, but for the, for the general consumer, sometimes they just don't know. Yeah, uh, it's which is an, another thing that always drives me crazy. It's like, I wish I could figure out how to like make it a, a Harvard for real estate agents or, you know, because like I would go to that. I would, you know, I would I would go to that school to be uh, the top of my game. But also it's the way that buyers don't know enough to to look for an agent. They go on Zillow. Right. And, and I pay for Zillow, so I'm not knocking it by any means. But this, this person's 
my first four million dollar deal, the guy clicked, you know, find an agent, and that's how they got me. That's like mind blowing. <laughs> I, I know it's amazing and it's scary at the same scary time. Scary for them. Yeah. Yeah. Like very lucky for me, and I mean, he's coming to my wedding. They're big family friends of mine now. This is years later, and I, there, I'm so thankful for them. But he clicked on Zillow, and that's how he found me. So how do we change the narrative of how you? you do your research like you do more research to get a hairdresser than you do to get a real estate agent it's true and that's so to kind of rewind that's what the whole crux of this this the realtor 180 is is it's a it's free education for anybody who wants to tune in there's two and a half million agents in in the nation and the only thing you need is internet connection basically but then you have the opportunity to sit down and listen to hear these little nuggets being dropped from top performers literally in every pocket of the US. And the show, if you go back to the library, you can learn anything you want, how to build a team, how to deal with commissions, or uh, how to market yourself, how to talk differently about the business. Like there's tons and tons of hours that you can get a 100% free education, not just this channel, the internet's an amazing place. There's a lot of garbage out there, but it's also an amazing place. So it's so true. And maybe maybe we can brainstorm one day to figure out how to, you know, do something with this untouched market of not having, of teaching people. Well, you're doing it by the podcast. I mean, this is awesome, but teaching people how important it is to, to look for the right agent and what to look for and all the things that I'm sure you can find online, but I don't think people realize, you know? Um, and, and maybe as we evolve, you know, the real estate industry will change a little. There's so many conversations about the commission and this and that. And I'm like, that's not what's really important. There's so many other things that are important. Like the commission is the conversation of the commission is like, yes, now we've had to relearn our value proposition and understand that stuff, which is great. But like, ultimately I am a firm and I'm sure every agent is a firm believer that you have to have a buyer's agent and a seller's agent and that they do, they do totally different jobs, you know? So um, those conversations, I'm like, well, let's focus more on like the things that are important, which is like why that buyer is clicking on Zillow versus why is there not, you know, more back end of how to know your agent and know their worth and know their value and know their education and all those things. Yeah. Oh, well, more importantly, how is Zillow able to aggregate our information that we worked hard to create, put up, and then they basically sell it back to us? Yeah. Which drives me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. my two cents on that um, but so for you um, the cool thing is once you're a guest on the show you get a personal invite from me to the inner circle group and that's a uh, it's a mastermind group of all the past agents so you have an official invite to uh, that that's awesome I and you know we were talking about when we first got on this call I was like in a little bit of a funk because the market's beating me up um, but I needed that. So thank you. That's of really, course. really awesome. I um, was really thinking like I wasn't going to be able to present myself the way I wanted to today because our last time we were in such a different place. But this this is why we do these things because they change. They get like it's like I'm back motivated. It's like I'm back like reminded of what I love about the industry and all the things that I want to think about and all the things I care about just from these simple conversations that you brought to light today. I love it. I appreciate that. And same. I I always I look forward to these conversations so much because it inspires me to look at my business different, to look at my life different, to remind me, hey, keep working out. It's keeping you sane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Now I'm like, you do two a day. I don't going to tell my fiance that because he'll literally kill me. But if I yesterday I wanted to do two workouts and he was like, what? do you need to do two workouts for? And I was trying to explain to him, F45 does more weights, arms, and legs. <laughs> and he's like, what? I'm like, all right, whatever. But I, you motivated me to figure out something else to do because I think working out is so, so important. So I'm glad we talked about that. So here's my hack. Um, I'm a little bit different than you. I I don't actually like working out with people. I, I it's it's a place for me to process and think and just kind of work on myself. And so I have all beautiful home gym and so I have a treadmill and I, we have a bike and so the first thing I do I get up I make a coffee and I go immediately in there and so my commute time is a minute 30 yeah. seconds um, 
And then at night, same thing. If, if I'm home, if I've worked on home or, or if I'm in proximity, I can just, again, I can go down there. It's, it's, it's amazing. And so I set it up in a way where it's extremely convenient for me to be able to do it the two times a day. And that evolved too. It's, yeah. It's, it just, it was, instead of doing it in one session, because it was too much time as a commitment, I, I wound up breaking it up. But I also, I, I try to be really efficient with time. And so when I'm working out, I'm listening to an audiobook. So I'm trying to learn. So I'm doing two things simultaneously. And in the morning, to your point earlier is, some days I wake up in a funk. I'm just miserable. Like the, the mountain is too big for me to climb that day and I hate it. And so I listen to intentionally, I have a whole playlist of motivational videos. And anytime I find something that just gives me a little bit of a boost, I throw it in there and I go back to those on those days. And I try to just rewire my brain a little bit and have a new approach for that day. So Yeah, I think that's so special that you said that because some days are like that and I think it's okay that it's definitely okay to have those days where you wake up and you're just like you said the mountain's hard to climb that day and that's that's true and what I do those days is I get my ass to the gym because I know once I get there I am going to feel much better and if I don't I'm probably going to stay in that funk for the rest of the day exactly and it's i mean again it goes back to there's actual science behind it but you're oxygenating your brain you're releasing all your hormones you're you're basically purging your your body and then your mind follows and it's like oh yeah actually we feel pretty good now and then it's you can start at that point and so jess this was an absolute pleasure i always enjoy sitting down and chatting with you Um, and keep an eye out that invite is coming Oh, I will definitely be keeping an eye out. Thank you very much for including me in this. And I love watching it. I love watching what you're doing. um, And I really appreciate the opportunity. Of course. And that is a wrap.